into your presence and we've sung your praises and we've sung how you broke chains and you set us free and you forgave us. Oh, what a Savior you are. We lift up your matchless name, the name above all names, Jesus. You are Lord. You are Savior. You are friend. Make us more like you today because we were in your presence and heard from your word. Change us from the inside out. We praise you, Jesus, and pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. We are praising the King that he's alive in VBSC and for our opportunities and regional missions. God really just gave us a sweet time the last few days and we are so very, very thankful. All of you that uh, joined in, thank you God for your heart, for the mission and uh, um, what a successful time in the camp and all the things that went on. Let me, uh, you know what, why don't you just go ahead and cue up the, the video. It'll explain a little bit of part of uh, and show what we do for camp. Um, just, this just a quick little, little sound bite, little, quick little one there. Go ahead. It is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay. Amen. Oh, they cut it off. Good job, kids. Way to go. Now, what's the address of that verse, everybody that memorizes it? 11. Very good. Brenda, you're supposed to know it, so I mean, you know. But that's just a small little example. When we have camp uh, and uh, we're outside with all those tents, Bible, sports, and worship, and each day ending out with some singing and uh, just tremendous worship with the children, and in between all of that, some lunch, and, and uh, hey, again, can you, can you beat having Lunchables, hot dogs, and last day, Chick-fil-A nuggets? Woo! Now you adults want to go to camp, don't you? Yeah, yeah. They're not going to have that good food over at youth camp, so, you know, I'm just kidding. Just don't know. But, uh. It was really just a, a sweet picture of love never fails and how you and I sometimes just need to experience the body of Christ. Be in, be in on it. Say, hey, I'll be part of it. I'll be part of the work that God is doing. Bill was just sharing how he's been part of uh, some really, really good times in the mission work of just assembling Bibles. That's another piece of the body of Christ doing the work God's called. And we had our camp for a few days, and we had Mighty Mites on Saturday. And, oh, my, the, the kids still wanted to play. We played five innings. They still wanted to play. I said, no, we're not playing anymore. Oh, come on, bro. No, we're not playing anymore. Aren't you tired? No, let's play another inning. Oh, but really, uh, just a wonderful time of ministering to children yesterday in our Mighty Mites and just outreach opportunities and, and hearing how even last Sunday the investors got together and had a great time and they're singing and, and being able to worship the Lord. We just prayed over our Oaxaca uh, group that's going, 11 of us, and then uh, Paloma is going to join us. We're headed to Oaxaca on Saturday morning and preparing for that. We have our last um, mission team uh, prep and training right after church today. What a wonderful team God's put together there. All of these bits and pieces are just part of God's plan, God's purpose, God's choosing us and calling us out. You become a born-again person in Christ. You're a new creature in Christ. He says, I'll choose you for this. I'll choose you for that. I've got this purpose for you. I've got this purpose for you. You're holding that. Is that a little Ezekiel? He's going to be a prophet. Hallelujah. We don't know. But we're going to have baby dedication here in a little bit. And the whole purpose behind that is the purpose-filled heart and commitment of a woman named Hannah who said, 
Oh, God, if you would give me a child. I'm barren. I can't have a child. If you give me a child, I'll return him back to you for your purpose. And God chose old Samuel to carry out, excuse me, carry out the messenger work of God as an Old Testament missionary and the work that God used him in. So, everyone, we have a calling in the Lord, and he wants to finish the work in us, and part of it is getting involved in mission work, getting involved in personally, what does God want me to do? How does God want me to go about it? He does want us to understand the whole premise of love never fails. We introduced this study a few weeks ago. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Let me hit a a couple of highlights from last week and a couple of verses that we jumped in and and just kind of remind you where we're at. We're going to cover verses 18 through 31 today, but verse number 13 says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I highlighted those and and, and put them in a yellow just to jump off of there. Now listen, just think for a minute. Those three questions really were our introduction introduction to the series and then our first message in the series last week and we're going to go off of that third question or were you baptized in the name of Paul is Christ defined and we're really going to summarize those because verses 18 through 31 cover a great deal of material when it comes to this wrestling match of this church in this this area which is very simply are you going to follow man and his wisdom are you going to follow God and his word And here we are today being reminded that Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. I don't want any credit for anything. I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. We covered this last week. For when we finished up our message last week, we looked at verse number 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, not with this worldly wisdom way, but rather about Christ and his cross, lest the cross of Christ should be main of none effect. We're going to get into verse number 18 down through 31. Consider that simple statement. It's very, very powerful. That if you and I lose track of the love of Christ... God's incredible love for us in that he sent us Jesus while we were yet sinners. And we start using the wisdom of our words. We get caught up in that baptism is more important. Baby dedication is more important. Some ceremonies and rituals and traditions are more important. My Bible classes are more important. All those things are more important. He's saying, whoa, wait a minute, time out. That will make the cross of Christ of none effect. Because the wisdom of words will get in the way of the power of the gospel. When you look up at that statement up on the the screen that says love never fails, you're reminded of the power of the cross and the greatest expression of love of the Lord Jesus Christ and that finished work. And we're reminded that when you see that cross, when you understand that, that cross and the love that's poured out there, you also see something else, and that's part of our message today. And that's the incredible wisdom of God. See, how do you, how do you see that? We're going to see that here in this passage of Scripture because when it really comes down to it, God's wisdom is completely fulfilled and shines deeply and greatly in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Most of the world misses this incredible wisdom of God because he knew before the foundation of the world that the lamb had to be slain. He knew as he put things before man and he made Adam and he made Eve that he made provision for them. He didn't give them permission to sin. He made a way for them because he knew. And he knows you. And he put the word of God before you. And he put his wisdom before you. And at the preaching of the cross, we see the power of God, which we'll look at. That is God's incredible wisdom coming through. The simple definition of wisdom is that it's the right use or exercise of knowledge. It's the choice of laudable ends. Today, in verses 18 through 31, and we've already touched on it a little bit in the first few verses, but now we're going to say, see it really focus in. And it actually goes through the whole 
uh, the whole complete way of chapter number 2. From verse number 17, where wisdom is mentioned, all the way to the end of verse number 16 in chapter 2, we see wisdom mentioned. Paul the Apostle saying, church, how did you lose your way? Corinthian church, Corinthian people, what happened so quickly where is the scribe? Where, what happened? Where is this? What happened to you guys? How is it that you ended up going to a place where you would rely more on your wisdom than rely on the wisdom of me? The choice of laudable ends and the best means to accomplish them. Scripture, in Scripture, wisdom is human learning. The knowledge of arts and science. Moses was learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians, it says in Acts 7. In Scripture's theology, wisdom is true religion, godliness. It's the knowledge and fear of God, the sincere and uniform obedience to his commands. So I don't have much wisdom. Let me just give you a little hint. If you would open up the Bible and read it and then digest it. Not five-minute devotions, those, those are fine. The scripture verse of the day on you version, fine. But you are settling in on a wisdomless faith. You are settling in on a worldly wise way. You get 30 minutes of a podcast, an hour of some teaching, an hour of that, and that's good. But when you read the word of God and say, God, speak to me, talk to me. And then you say, okay, God, what you showed me today, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to take what you gave me, and I'm going to go and put it into my life. That's wisdom. That's God's way of doing it. God says, forgive. Okay, I'm going to put that into practice. God says, forbear. I'm going to put that into practice. That's really good wisdom. In fact, that's just simply God's way. No, God says, I need to forgive people. But I just don't feel like it. I'm going to forgive Derek, but I'm not going to forgive Cassidy, which is probably the best way to go. Not really. Well, I'm going to forgive him if he forgives me first. And then we go, Jesus Christ, forgive them for they know not what they do. I wonder why we make things so complicated when it comes to gaining wisdom from God. Well, the church at Corinth gave us a model how to make it a mess. I'd rather not follow that, but I fall into it sometimes. It says in Strong's Concordance, wisdom, broad and full of intelligence, used of the knowledge of very diverse matters. I don't have much wisdom. Yes, open up the word of God. Read it. Understand that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, but they are, for they are foolishness to them. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man, the lost man, the person that's not converted, does not understand the things of God. Now you go back to Solomon, he says, answer a fool according to his folly, answer not a fool according to his folly. That's confusing, no it's not. There are times when you answer a fool according to their folly, and there are times where you do not answer a fool according to her folly, because natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Oh, the Word of God works that way. Yeah, because it has the same author. This entire section of 1 Corinthians 1.17 through 2.16 presents constant contrast, numbers and numbers and numbers of contrast. You see the word wise, you see the word wisdom, and you're going, what does it really mean? Well, wisdom that belongs to man is the science and learning, the act of interpreting dreams, and God may give that, or man may say, hey, let me tell you how I can do it. But when it comes to the wisdom of God, it belongs to God. It's supreme intelligence, just like it is of Christ. The wisdom of God as invinced in forming and executing councils in the formation and in government of the world and of scriptures. And when God orchestrates something, I'll remind you, I've said it before, when you study the word of God and how government is supposed to be, it was to reflect the government of God in heaven. Study the word. You want to have wisdom on how to deal with what you're dealing with here? Look at how God has all put it in place divinely and heavenly, and he brought it here to earth through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through his prophets, that way he spoke in diverse manners. 
and sundry times in the Old Testament. Then he said, wait a minute, I got a better way. Let me send Jesus Christ. Now let's put things together with Jesus. Let's birth the church on Jesus. Let's make Jesus preeminent. Let's make Jesus the head of the body. Let's make Jesus all in all. And I'll follow that. As he told the church at Colossae. As he's teaching the church at Corinth. But we also have to look at this other place. This philosophy aspect. Because it intertwines with wisdom. Philosophy. The simple definition is literally the love of wisdom. So it ties together. The love of wisdom. But in modern acceptation, philosophy is a general term denoting an explanation of the reason of things. If you were to look up and study natural philosophy, you would be studying, for all you science people, physics. Right? If you were to study moral philosophy, you would be studying ethics. Got it? If we were to study God's philosophy, we would be looking at theology, the love of wisdom. You see, the word defines a statement or a clarity of meaning of your approach to something. So the word philosophy is not bad in itself if you look at the essence of its meaning. Philosophy mentioned in the Word of God once is very simply from Strong's Concordance, the love of wisdom used either of zeal or for skill, excuse me, for or skill in any art or science, any branch of knowledge. You can have knowledge of the Word of God. Well, I got more knowledge in you than I'm smarter than you. All of a sudden now you've brought in your vanity and your way, and that's what happened in the church at Corinth. As you see in verse number 12, now this I say that every one of you say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am, I am Christ. Those are pretty good people, <laughs> I think. But the way they were saying of I am Christ is they were stepping and saying, I'm better because I'm of Christ. Instead of saying, I thank God that I'm saved and born again of Christ. I'm of Cephas, I'm of Peter. There's no one that can be more powerful than the Apostle Peter who headed up being God's uh, Jesus' uh, missionary to send out to start the church in the book of Acts. Apollos, what a great teacher. We find him in the book of Acts. Paul himself. But when it gets twisted, and when it gets a little messed up, then you've got Colossians chapter number 2, where it is mentioned, Beware any man be spoil you with through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of man... After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Again, that's part of the investor's verses that are the core root. Which says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And then comes that, beware. If you don't get discipled and grown in the word of God, and you grab a hold of Jesus as preeminent, the Holy Spirit of God as your teacher, as Father God, as the one that's over all, and you let the man philosophy, the man traditions, the foolishness of man get in the way, then guess what happens? Your zeal for and skill in any of the art and sciences is now more important than Theology, doctrine, and the word of God. You see, love never fails. And that's at the core root of this series. Why? Because you interject that agape love of God in the midst of this, and you bring out the preaching of the cross as being most important because there's the power. You lessen the importance of God, uh, excuse me, of, of man, and the, bring out the importance of God. If you read these verses, of course, we're going to read them in a minute, and you see the depth of them, you go, love never fails. What do you mean? Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity? And I become as a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. Listen, very simply as we covered this introduction two weeks ago, this is what we're talking about. Tongues of men and, men and angels. Uh, I don't have charity. I have, I'm a sounding brass. I have to have the gift of prophecy. I can teach better than anybody else, and that's why I'm in the church at Corinth. That's why I'm at the church at First Bible, because I'm a better teacher than anybody. I have the gift of prophecy. I understand all mysteries. I have all knowledge, and I have all faith. I can remove mountains, but I don't love like God loves. Then I have nothing. Now, if you have all that, that's fine. But if you have all that love, and then that comes, hallelujah. 
the issue in the church at Corinth is that they were gaining these factions and divisions. They had contentions, as it says in verse number 11, verse number 10. There's things that are just not going right because Jesus Christ is no longer the centerpiece of their church. And our theme verse of 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But love never fails. That agape, charity, love never, ever fails. That brings us to breaking down this chapter. And very simply, I just want you to, again, just kind of follow along and track through as we read this passage. And then look at four simple things. And say, okay. Again, the question, how did they get here? How do we stop this from happening to us personally? I don't want our ministry to get to a place where we're relying on the wisdom of ourselves, the wisdom of the world, the great philosophies. But so many of you, that's all you rely on. That's where you live. And your pride and your arrogance has gotten the way, and you think you know the best way to do it. Why am I saying that to you and not myself? I am. Because we get that way. This church at Corinth was operating for about four years, and bam, a letter was sent back and saying, beware, look out, you're a mess, you've got contentions, no longer are you just being fo following Jesus Christ, you're being led by men, you're, you're, you're dividing and breaking things up, and you're taking away the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. You know what? We can get tripped up. We can get tripped up. Thus the title of our message. We forget that so easily we're tripped up. That was the cue to flip the slide. There you go. I knew you were up there. Hey, we're going to go to Oaxaca together. I hope everything's going to be all right. We can get tripped up by human pride. I'm not talking about just, hey, you know this person that walks around arrogantly all the time and so they're like the meanest. And I'm talking about how all of us can be tripped up by our human nature pride. We really think we got something together then all of a sudden we're sitting in a place a few weeks, a few months, a few years and going, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. Without the word of God, without the spirit of God being relied on, we end up being in a place where we're tripped up by our human pride. Human pride very simply is this, and it's an inordinate self-esteem stature. It's an unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority in talents and beauty and wealth and accomplishments. Very simply put, our human pride manifests itself in these lofty airs these making distances from other people because I just can't, can't be around others. And often it leads to contempt of others. This is what's going on here. He is breaking down in the very beginning the number one thing that he starts his letter with. He says nice things for a few verses. They're doing okay. God is faithful. But in verse 10 when he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. I am saying that's what's going on here at the church of Corinth. And now we look at the word of God and we say, how did that happen? Well, this is a possibility from what I'm studying and reading and what the Spirit has shown me, that sometimes we just get tripped up. We get caught up by something. It might even be that we know the Bible better than someone else. We've raised our kids better than someone else. Maybe we've served in ministry and so we're better than everybody else because we have experience. We all can get tripped up by our human pride. Pride in the Old Testament through the concordance says a rising up, a self-majestic approach, haughtiness, exaltation of self. Pride in the New Testament is defined as to inflate, 
to blind with conceit, to puff up, and to render insolent. I know these things, because I know me. And oftentimes, I like to come up with some kind of excuse why I do some of the things I do and try to excuse it off. The excuse, though, that I use is a real clear statement to me that when the words come out of my mouth, I need to hear from God when he's speaking and saying, you're being arrogant, you're being tripped up by your own self. You're thinking of your philosophy of life as being more important than the word of God. You're finding yourself to make your own way instead of following after God's way. So in these scriptures, real quick, very simply, I want to read through them and take a look and just make a couple of quick highlight lessons like we always do when we think about this series, Love Never Fails, the second half of chapter number one, join with me in verse number 18 as we see how they get tripped up. They get tripped up by their human pride and so don't we. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Highlighted. Very simply, look. It's the power of God to all of us that are saved. Verse number 19 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Wow. Wow, that's a a strong statement right there. Truly, Paul is making a statement for us. That it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. All the other self-made ways, all the human, worldly wisdom ways, they do not work to save us. He continues, verse number 23, 22 down. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews it's a stumbling block, unto the Greeks it's foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's a good verse to memorize. Yes, It's Christ. You can't miss by living after Christ, walking after his ways. It's in the power of him, holy God. It's in the wisdom of holy God, by his word that he's left before you. You know what word of God they have in front of them? They have the Old Testament that they can use when they have a gathering on their worship day, the first day of the week. And then they have this letter that was sent to them by Paul from Ephesus, by courier. He didn't send an email. And he sends it, and they read part of it every Sunday. Every time they got together, maybe during the week, they had a study. And here they are sitting around, gathering together in 56 AD, going, Wow, Paul, how do you know that this is going on here when you only got a short word about a testimony? Because the Holy Ghost wrote this down through my hand, because this is what I needed to give you for a message, that Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God is what we have to stay upon. That's the wisdom. That's God's way. He continues in verse number 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than man. Man, for ye are your, for see your calling. Hey, brethren, brothers in Jesus Christ, this is your calling by God after salvation. That this church in Corinth, that is part of an epicenter, a metropolis of tons and thousands of dollars of money going through. There is commerce that's flooding the place. They worship all kinds of gods. They have philosophies. It is said that they had 50-ish places of education, philosophy centers, places of geniusness. And you think that this calling from God isn't serious? He's saying, hey, church at Corinth, you're born again now. You're new creatures in Christ. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many mobile are called, but you're called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Stay with my stuff, he's saying. 
the base things of the world and the things which are despised, hath God chosen ye in things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should be glory in his presence. I want to use the things that are completely opposite of what the world would use. I'm going to use the people that God never would, uh, that the world will never use, but God will use so that man doesn't get the glory. So man is being is stepped back and he's being lessened and the glory goes to God. Verse number 30 and 31 as he finishes out. But of him are ye in Christ, Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. To me, this love never fails theme continues to intertwine itself. Because you can have all the stuff that we have read, tongues of men and angels, and you don't have charity. You're a mess. Gift of prophecy, mysteries, knowledge. They had lost their love for the Lord, and they lost their love for each other in the purest form. And that was part of how this letter starts out with them taking Jesus Christ off the throne of their church and off the throne of their lives and saying, I'm better because I'm of Cephas. I'm better because I am of Paul. That's not what Paul wanted, and that's not what he taught. We're tripped up by our human desires, excuse me, our human pride. We're tripped up by that. It sneaks up behind us, and we forget that the preaching of the cross is what really equals the power of God. Remember, Paul told the church at Colossae, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ, please, heads up, Watch out. You're going to lose your power. You're going to have a power shortage. You're not going to have the power of the cross in your preaching message. You're not going to have the power of the Holy Spirit in your teaching. You're not. You're just going to be acting like you're a natural man even though you're born again. And there, in the essence of it, is what we see here in these verses from 18 through 31. So let me give you four quick lessons. Each one of them just take a few minutes here. Watch this. The first one is this. Remember, tripped up by human pride. In his arrogance, man believes his power saves more than God's. Man can save himself. Sure. Well, I'm born again. I know that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I put my faith and trust in Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. The Bible says by Jesus' own words... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It's the only way. You have to go, to Je- go through Jesus Christ. Okay, that's fine. Well, the arrogant man believes that. Uh, he's saved and he's born again. Let's take the saved person. He says, hey, I'm in a jam. I'll get out of it myself. I need to save myself from the mess that I'm in. That may be so. When you think that continually that the philosophy of this world tells you, just get the right ingredients, mix it all together, and you'll have a way of getting out of the jam that you're in, that the messes that you have in your life, spiritually speaking, can be taken care of because you've got experience, because you got out of it before, because someone told you what to do. Be careful how far you go down that road because you can be tripped up by your own human pride. We all can. Oh, I have the answers. One of the crazy things about being a pastor is a lot of people just come to me with my, for counsel. They want my opinion. They want just to tell them, you know, what should I do? How should I do this? And that's a dangerous place to go. Well, you've got pastor. You've got experience. And I can even speak that way and say, oh, okay, just tell us what to do. The right thing for me to do is the Bible says... The Bible says, the Bible says. That's the believer that in their arrogance believes that your own power can save you more than God's power can take care of you. What about the lost person? The lost person thinks, I can just do enough works to make God happy. I was uh, texting with Damon Renzulli the last couple of days. He's over in Italy, and uh, he's in Rome, and he's over there where the Pope is and Catholicism and the headquarters of everything. And Damon and I share an upbringing of Catholicism. And uh, it's not the people that represent that religion that bothers me. It's the core root of that religion. And he says, 
we need to talk when I get back. I have learned so much about the roots of how this thing is so deceptive and so ma and we, we see that. Well, any religion, any church can get to a point where it's following man and the arrogance of man that believes that he has the power to save something, save someone is crazy. It says up on the screen there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 13, I go to my notes and I have it right here. It says this. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Your life and the power of God and the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. That's where we need to live. You say, well, I'm saved, but I don't have power. I'm saved, but I don't feel like I'm strong. I'm saved, but I get, still get caught up in the wisdom of the world. I will tell you very simply that you already know the answer of why that is. Because you don't hear from God very much. Because you don't go after the things of God and you don't pursue God like you're supposed to. Because if you go after it, you say, well, sometimes I open the Bible and I can't hear anything. Does that mean you're supposed to stop? Are you supposed to forget that it's trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path? Has that been forgotten by us? Is it been forgotten by us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord? Has it forgotten by us to light thyself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of thine heart? Paul's very simply saying in his second letter that he wrote to the church of Corinth, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. The second lesson very simply is this up on the screen. It says, in his arrogance, man believes his wisdom is better than God's. It says in the scriptures here in verse number 22, the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. They already had their way of doing things in their DNA. If they relied on their fleshly nature, if you are someone that was raised in a religious setting, maybe a Baptist, maybe you went to a private school, maybe you went to a good Christian school, maybe you had a devotion and you had a, a Bible class every day, every week, you say, I know, I know everything about God. Why do I have to go to church? I've already had all the classes. I've already had seminary. I've already gone to the shepherd school. I've already taken online stuff. The arrogance of man believes his wisdom is better than God's. It's easy to say that to the lost person. Yeah, it's true. But the Jews, they require to sign. The Greeks, they seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, unto the Greeks' foolishness. It kind of brings it all down baseline. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, as I mentioned earlier, Verse number 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. We really think we're something, don't we? We think we're pretty smart. I've mentioned that before. We talked in our series on Ecclesiastes. That old uh, Solomon, he lost track. John MacArthur wrote in his commentary in 1 Corinthians, One modern, our modern day advances in knowledge and technology and communication have not really advanced us. It is from among those that are intelligent and clever that the worst exploiters, deceivers, and oppressors come. We are more educated than our forefathers, yet, but, he says, but we are not more moral. We have more means of helping each other, but we are not less selfish. We have more means of communication, but we do not understand each other any better. We have more psychology and education, and more, but we, yet we have more crime and more war. We have not changed except to finding ways to express and excuse our human nature. Throughout history, human wisdom has never basically changed and has never solved the basic problems of sin. It's sin. The Greeks... To all of this, they said it's foolish. They didn't see any wisdom in the cross. They missed the message of the great wisdom of God that man needed a savior and a redeemer. They saw in their own educational background that there was total inconsistency, and yet they wouldn't admit it. They were crushed by their own arrogance, their pride. They thought they had it all together, and they died and went to hell. And those that were converted and born again that were Greeks formerly went back to the old ways and started living as though they were smarter than God. In his arrogance, man believes his wisdom is better than God's. You better take a look at yourself. We all better take a look at ourselves and say, 
Whose wisdom are we leaning on? Are you leaning on your wisdom? Are you leaning on God's wisdom? It says in 2 Corinthians chapter number one, for our rejoicing is this, that the testimony of our consciousness, that in simplicity, in godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but the grace of God, there it is, the grace of God, he gives you things with his love, he gives you things you cannot earn. It's by the grace of God we have had our conversation in the world, our way of behavior. It's by his grace that he's made you the believer that you are. And more abundantly to you word, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1. Some believed in the cross, but a lot of people, they just tripped over it. They laughed. They mocked it. And they said, ah, that cross stuff, that message of Jesus, I'm smarter than God. I have more wisdom than him. Thirdly, very simply is this. In his arrogance, man believes his might is more than God's. You see in verse number 26. For see, ye see your calling, brethren, how that many, no, excuse me, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many, many, mighty, not many noble are called. But, again, I mentioned this earlier in reading through, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God says, hey, let me break you down for a minute. You think you're really sharp and really smart and you really think you've got it together? Let me give you some of the foolish things of this world to confound all those wise people that think they know so much. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. You really think you're mighty? You really think you're bad? You really think you're tough? You really think you've got all the answers in life? I'll use the base things, the lower things. I will use the things that nobody else will use. I will use the things that are despised. Had God chosen, yea, I will take the people, and that's why I called you out, church at Corinth. I gave you an assignment. Reach the most debauchery-ridden people in the face of the earth and reach them for me and then teach them my wisdom, not your wisdom. In his arrogance, man believes his might is more than God. In his arrogance, people think that their wisdom is better than God's wisdom. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, a really familiar passage about how when you are weak, his strength is what you need. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Why are we always running from our infirmities? I want the power of God to rest upon me. I'm not welcoming him like I'm going to open up the door and say, God, make me suffer. But how is it that you and I have become so soft and so weak in our own philosophy of life? Arrogant men believe that their might is more than God's might. When I'm broken down and I'm weak and I don't want to keep on going, I ask God, please give me strength. And every time he delivers in my weakness, every single time, he gives me the courage and the strength to be brave, like we told those little children. We tell those children from 5 to 12, don't believe in the foolish things of this world, but believe in the wisdom of God out of Hebrews chapter number 11. And yet we fall back and we get tripped up by our own human pride. That doesn't mean you won't be tripped off when you get a handle on this. It just means that you need to be aware of your, your, your flesh is tripping you up. My flesh is tripping me up. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Whew, thank you, God, for the truth of your word and your wisdom. And lastly, the last lesson I have for you. In his arrogance, man believes his glory is higher than God's. This is where it gets a little goofy. Because verse 29, to piggyback off that, to go into verse 30, God's saying through his word that I don't want to have any flesh glory in my presence. I don't want any flesh that had the chance to explain me in their way. Let me explain me, and then you read what I've said about myself. And then that explains God. Well, God did this, and God did that. I love some of the people that have been in my life over the years. When they give glory to God, it reminds me how arrogant I am. How I love to insert myself into something that God orchestrated. And then say, ah, oh, aren't I just a wonderful leader? And I shut my mouth. 
How is it that in my arrogance, I can believe that his glory, my glory, is bigger than his glory? How I have to get credit for something. I need no credit from anybody. All the glory goes to him. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. He deserves the extolling. He deserves the exaltation. It is his and his alone. And anything that you're part of that has any type of glory and shining is because of him. Stop taking the glory from God. We need to get a handle on how arrogant we get to be. How we stick ourselves into something and say, oh, I had to pray about that. Maybe it was because I prayed for it. Oh, God, forgive me for taking credit for something that's all his glory. Somehow we think that my glory is bigger than his. Let him get what he deserves because he just lets you borrow it for a minute. Because one day you will understand his glory and I will. And we will be able to handle it. In this form we can't. But when he gives us a glorious body, when he gives us a glorious resurrection, then we'll go, wow, that's glory. He says in verse number 30 and 31, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in God. Let him glory in the Lord. Who in the world has the right to push God aside and take glory for things? Forgive me, Father. Forgive me. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. And I want to take that. In Christ, we are set apart for a particular purpose. We're made holy in him. You cannot make yourself holy. You can put on a show for everybody while you're filled with dead men's bones. White sepulcher. Our redemption's found in Jesus Christ. In Christ, believers receive God's redemption. That's what it says there. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are God's. That's his words, not mine. It says up on the screen, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. You notice there's an awful lot of writing in 2 Corinthians. Obviously, it's because he wrote two letters to them, and it's said that we're thinking that it's not in the scriptures that he wrote one before that, a short one. It says in verse number 17 of 2 Corinthians 10, but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. That's it. Verse number 18, for not he that commendeth himself is approved. I commend myself. I'm pretty wonderful. I don't know if you know that. I'm probably the nicest guy I know. Probably the best looking guy I've ever known. I haven't been around much. I can do more things than anybody. How awful that sounds. Even as a joke, it sounds awful. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. If God commends you and does this, hallelujah. If God says, you're my son, which he does in him and Jesus, you're my son. I commend you. I commend you. Just like these parents here in about two minutes are going to come up here. They're saying, this is my child. I commend them. They're beautiful in my eyes. They came from God. You as a parent, commend them. Even though a little child will let you know how wonderful they are to you, of course. We finish with this thought up on the screen. We must allow God's glory to humble us. Realizing we may have hidden arrogance. When you go through these words of God and he reveals things in your life, you just, you have to ask and I have to ask myself, 
in the, in the midst of his glory as he humbles us. Where is my hidden arrogance? Because the question is this. What specific aspect needs to be given over to God before you're tripped up? Tripped up by your human pride. Remember this. You won't be the first person that's tripped up. And if you think you're the only one, come see me. And I'll tell you how I've been tripped up and how God's made it all right when I gave him the opportunity to make it right. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we go to our invitation time. If you have a little child, parents, why don't you come up and sit in the front here? Just excuse yourself and get ready for our baby dedication up here in the front row. I get lonely up here, so I'd love to have you come up if that's okay. As we go in the, the Lord in prayer, I ask you just to consider again what it says there. What specific aspect needs to be given over to God before you are not tripped up, before you're tripped up by your human pride. Our Father in heaven, we humbly come to you in the name of Jesus. As we come in this invitation time and time of prayer, I pray you just speak to each one of us. I pray you give the courage that is necessary and the conviction to the men and women of this message that we have had today to just respond according to your will. As we see your glory, we're humbled. As we release to your glory, we're humbled. I'm humbled right now in your presence. I mean that, you know I do. Oh, there's things that I've given over to you that I know are aspects that can trip me up. And I thank you for clarity. And I thank you for pointed conviction. It's good. I just pray for everyone here. Before we have the time here in a moment or two to dedicate these babies unto you with their families, their moms and dads, I pray that you just give us a sweet time of prayer in our invitation. You receive the glory in Jesus' name. Please stand.